Hello and welcome to The Book Was Better, where we're watching today's movies one book at a time. Hey everyone, guess what? It's the fourth year anniversary! You know, there have been a lot of great stories written in the English language written by a great many authors. Shakespeare, Hemingway, Twain, me. But there's one story that's been handed down throughout the ages before we even had a written language. It's one of the oldest stories in English, if not THE oldest. And you'll learn all about it because today we're taking a look at Beowulf. Beowulf is a timeless classic, an epic poem with more than 3,000 lines to it. It tells the story of its eponymous hero, who slays the mighty Grendel, then goes on to defeat Grendel's mother, and much later a dragon threatening his kingdom. Books like this are a lot of fun to research, just because you get to see how much history there is not just in the story, but also the only existing original manuscript in the world. This single copy now resides in the British Library in London, but it narrowly avoided incineration when the Ashburnham house it was residing in caught fire in the 18th century. You'd think they'd find a better place to store a book than a place that has ash and burn in its name. While researching this, I've seen some sources claim that it could have been first composed as early as the 6th century, or as late as the 10th. The manuscript was believed to have been written down somewhere in the 10th or 11th century. There are also hints of alteration as the story was carried down through oral tradition, such as the inclusion of the Christian religion within the written text. But I suppose that could happen when your stories are communicated through what is effectively the telephone game. The original text is written in Old English, which sounds so unlike modern English that most people can't even see the similarities. What? We gardena in yer dagum theul kunninga thrum yu frunon, hu tha adelingas ellen fremedon. Since that would be impossible to get through, I'll be reading a translation by Seamus Haney, perhaps the most famous translation of the poem in the world today. If you're interested in more info, I'd recommend Michael Wood's BBC documentary, In Search of Beowulf, which I've used to help research this episode. The man's enthusiasm makes it fun to watch. Beowulf and Anglo-Saxon poetry are at the root of the great tree of English language and literature which has spread across the whole of the planet. To my mind, it's our nation's greatest gift to the world. Now on to the movie. There have been multiple versions of Beowulf in movie form and a literary alteration in Michael Crichton's Eaters of the Dead, but today's movie came out in 1999. Oh wait, wait. Did you think I was reviewing the CGI version that came out in 2007? <laughs> no, no. Because despite what you might think, that's the good version of this story. Today's movie is much, much worse. Like I started before, this version of Beowulf came out in 1999 and stars Rona Mitra, Oliver Cotton, Gotts Otto, Vincent Hammond, and him. Lord Raiden, God of Thunder, Connor McCloud, the Highlander, some funny third thing. It is Christopher Motherfucking Lambert. Now, while casting the distinguished Christopher Lambert would make any movie an instant classic, there were several, shall we say, stupid choices made. For one, this was not set in the 6th century, as many scholars believe the book was, but is set in a post-apocalyptic future. And just in case you think I'm making it up, the back of the DVD case says, Christopher Lambert stars in this update of the classic poem set in a futuristic world of supernatural evil and inexplicable danger. But good luck finding any signs of that, since you'll mostly see stone walls and melee weapons. And do you want special effects? Well, you better look elsewhere because these effects are so bad they'll make you long for the N64 era. Also, the script, dialogue, action scenes, props, costumes, and acting all have less effort put into them than a high school play performed by bored hipsters. When you're a hipster, life seems poetic. You like your fans hot before they're cool. Do you remember Master of Disguise, that disastrous Dana Carvey movie with only a 1% rating on Rotten Tomatoes? Well, this version of Beowulf has a 0% rating. Yes, today's movie is so bad, it's ranked worse than this. Um. So unfortunately, the talented Mr. Lambert was not quite good enough to raise this movie out of the muck. 
So exactly how bad do you have to screw up to get a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes? Will this movie be so bad it's good? Will setting the story in the future have any impact? I don't think so. Well, just remember... The book was better than the movie. Huh. I should really start opening with that. This is Beowulf, a big blockbuster bastardization. So right off the bat, we see that this entire movie is just the 90s desperately clinging to life at the close of the decade. Just listen to the intro music. <sighs> this just takes me back to hanging out at the arcade when I was a kid. This movie is so 90s that I could probably do a counting gag on outdated cliches alone. Seriously, where's the 90s kid when you need him? Anyway, the movie opens to... this guy, who doesn't have a name or any real impact on the plot. We see he's guarding the perimeter of an unnamed castle in an unnamed kingdom. Yeah, this movie leaves a lot of holes unfilled. Nameless here is guarding the castle because of a curse laid upon it. They're afraid because the castle has been besieged by a demon who actually does have a name, Grendel. He's busy slaughtering the castle guardsmen while Hrothgar carries his giant saw blade into battle. Father! Go back in your room, Kara! Get back in your room! Well, at least he didn't say kitchen. Go inside. Please. Wow! Okay, I see we're using everyone's first take on this, huh? So Grendel finishes his nightly rampage and vanishes into the shadows before we get a good look at him. We skip to the next afternoon when some rando escapes the castle and runs into Nameless and his guards. Oh wait, did I say guards? Because this is more like a Silent Hill cult. The cultists believe that anyone who comes out of the castle has to be killed, lest they spread the curse of Grendel. Lady. You've given me one line and your acting is so bad that I kind of want to see you die now. But of course, that doesn't happen as Beowulf makes his dramatic entrance. Cut her loose. She's from the outpost. The place is infested with evil. No one gets away from there and lives. And this is Christopher Lambert's Beowulf, rocking the white hair again. Although, I think he looks less like Beowulf and more like Geralt of Rivia. And just like that, the first of many, many action scenes play out. And if you thought the music in the beginning was really 90s, just look at the fight scenes. This gets so bad that we move on to a counting gag that I am going to use. If you're playing at home and trying to guess how high that counter will go, trust me, you're not guessing high enough. So Beowulf rescues the girl and cuts this guy's hand off, then finishes the fight with another flip. <laughs> Nameless lets Beowulf and the girl go, and the two start back towards the castle. Then the girl runs back into the crowd, and they just kill her anyway. Well, that was pointless. Beowulf makes his way to the castle, where some of the castle staff try mocking him. Brilliant idea, considering the guy carries more weapons than the Punisher. Beowulf, I've heard that name before. Oh yeah? What'd you hear? Stories only idiots would believe. Only an idiot would come to this damn place. <laughs> Unless he was already damned. Beowulf is brought before Hrothgar, played by Oliver Cotton. You think that we've got buried gold here? Or are you just a lover of drafty old outposts? No, I'm a lover of drafty old men. <laughs> What brings you? The darkness. Darkness! Imprisoning me! All that I see! Absolute horror! I don't know the words. Beowulf is given a room for the night when Kyra stops by to say hi. Beowulf takes a not-so-subtle glance at Kyra's chest, and they converse. 
My husband used to come here when he drank. I haven't been here since he died. My condolences. I know the reason you're here. His family sent you, didn't they? So, this whole plot thread is something the movie made up entirely. Cairo was married to a nobleman from another kingdom, presumably one with a name. He died recently, but not to Grendel. His death was an accident. At weapons practice with Roland. Weapons practice can be so dangerous. Yeah, I'm with Beowulf on this one. I call bullshit. He had it coming. He had it coming. He only had himself to blame. We move on to weapons practice with Roland, the captain of the guard. His men are exhausted, having fought Grendel several times now, and are clearly experiencing sleep deprivation. Because it's not like his men need rest or anything. Soldiers just need coffee and abuse to function. Right, NPC? Yep. Pretty much. You attack me, understand? You attack me! And always remember... <laughs> it's not about weapons. In here, it counts. Okay, that line was terrible, but I can't help but laugh at the extra who clearly missed his cue there on the left. So far, my theory that this movie is made entirely out of first take seems to be correct. Night falls, and Grendel strikes again. Gee, I wonder who he's going to attack first. Could be anyone, what with this quiet, empty hallway and no one coming from any direction. Oh hey, it was the black guy. Beowulf and the others are just sitting down for dinner, with Cairo wearing a dress that looks a little too much like lingerie, when Beowulf's sixth sense flares up. Can you sense it? Sense what? This is bullshit! What is it? Evil. It's here. Evil! Evil! They find the weapons master, who also doesn't have a real name, dead. Changing its method. Never killed so early before. With the Weapons Master dead, the job is pushed onto his nephew, Will, played by Brent Jefferson Lowe. Well, of course everyone's gonna die anyway, but one thing's for sure is that I ain't no Weapons Master. You don't have to be good all the time. Just when it matters. Well, yeah, I mean, you're just dealing with melee weapons. It's not like anyone has access to laser blasters or plastic explosives or ballistic firearms. Why was this set in the future again? Beowulf enters the courtyard, searching for Grendel, when Kyra walks up to him. What are you? I'm trapped between two worlds. That's what I am. And apparently that's a good enough answer. Kyra just walks off again and leaves Beowulf to his hunt. Beowulf doesn't get far before Roland gets in the way. We need each other. I need no one. It's just me and Lefty. Roland, being the prideful idiot of the movie, then challenges Beowulf to a sword fight, but when Beowulf doesn't take out his sword, Roland just switches from his oversized greatsword to his small dagger instead. Who the hell does this guy think he is, Dracul Mihawk? Shock of all shocks, Beowulf wins the fight and disarms Roland. Don't push your luck, Roland. The night moves on and we see Hrothgar sleeping, while using no bedsheets and surrounded by multiple candles when he's approached by a topless woman who we need to censor. And the actor playing Hrothgar is apparently aware that she's topless and is pitching a tent for her. Yeah, so the topless chick grinds off happy Hrothgar here in a surprisingly unerotic scene. The movie's pandering pretty hard to that virgin teenager audience. Maybe I'm just distracted by the multiple staircases we see flash by, or Hrothgar's heavy breathing. It's almost finished, my love. Somehow I don't think she's talking about his new indoor pool. With the need for strong weapons increasing by the day, Will steps up as the new weapons master, but has a hard time navigating his uncle's forge. How do you tell all the junk from the critical stuff? Your uncle knew. Yeah, well, that's real helpful, Carl. Actually, I'm with Will on this. These weapons look like crap. It's not enough to make basic swords and maces. They all have to have some weird post-apocalyptic twists to them that make them look awful. Like this buzzsaw on the end of a stick. 
all the axes that look like they came out of World of Warcraft. And I swear, this mace is just a muffler with some nails glued to it. And come on, would you look at Hrothgar's sword? King swords are supposed to stand out as a symbol of leadership. This looks like he just raided a high school shop class. And don't get me started on Beowulf. Not only does he use his sword as a club when it's sheathed, which they are so not built to withstand, but he has a flail with a knife on the other end. Say what you will about gun blades, but there are some things you really, really don't want to combine. Knife range! Practical and safe. Whoa! Oh! And again, I ask, why was this set in the future? So far, I imagine that it sounds like I'm being really lenient towards this movie as far as how it was adapted. Well, it sucks, but not because of what was changed. It sucks because of what it left out. For example, in the book, Beowulf got a lot of praise when he showed up, telling exploits of past adventures. What does the movie give us? Beowulf, I've heard that name before. Oh yeah, what'd you hear? Stories only idiots would believe. Why does he travel? Where is he from? Why does he fight? What's he doing with his life? These questions are all answered within the poem, but the movie couldn't be bothered instead giving us some dull backstory to Kyra's ex-husband which, spoiler warning here, is a red herring. While Will goes out for supplies, Carl gets killed by Grendel. And this annoys me. No, not Grendel's proficiency for killing people off camera, but Carl's name in this setting. In a world where everyone has an ancient sounding name, despite being set in the future, where is Carl supposed to fit in? We have Beowulf, Rothgar, Grendel, Carl. Carl! With Hrothgar in dire straits, he orders all the women and children into a central chamber and seals it up so there's no way in. Guess what happens? What is it? Is there any other way in? All doors are secured from the inside. <laughs> Beowulf and Rothgar lead a small team of soldiers inside the room, carefully stepping around a sea of corpses. <laughs> Grendel continues his slaughter until Beowulf steps in and tries taking the monster out one on one. And you know what that means. This is also the first time we get to see Grendel in any meaningful fashion. He's just some large, muscular, purple beast that can apparently turn invisible and constantly rolls nat 20s on his stealth checks. However, what we can see of him through the ugly shimmer effects are... okay. They're not bad, but also not great. It's worth mentioning that Grendel was never actually described in the poem outside of a vague demon label, who was also immune to everything constructed by blacksmiths. Keep that point in mind for later. So, the design works, the movie crew just won't be winning any awards because of it. During the fight, none of Beowulf's weapons work, including this dagger that launches a chakram. Really? And you can even see the safety wire that Lambert uses to climb up a banister. Throughout the fight, we see guards getting killed with little more than a backhand, and Grendel slashes open Beowulf's chest. This scene only ends when Hrothgar challenges Grendel in one of the only cool moments of the movie. Me! Fight me! Later that night, while Beowulf is recovering, Rothgar gets another wet dream with the topless lady. And this time they're playing porno music, but not the good kind. This is like porn music written by someone who writes elevator music. We see the woman licking Rothgar, but all I can wonder is whether or not Oliver Cotton is wearing makeup or not. What does Foundation taste like? Kyra wakes up in the middle of the night to find Beowulf up and about. But how can this be after Grendel used his ribcage like a harp? You should be dead. Many times. Explain. I'm a quick healer. Not good enough. <sighs> okay, so this is another plot thread that the movie just made up. It tries to tease us to want to learn more about Beowulf's lineage, and normally this is the right way to do it. But as we'll see later on, the answer it gives us is just idiotic. What I want to know is, if Beowulf has nearly died so often, why doesn't he have any more scars or stories to tell? The next morning finds Beowulf telling Roland that it'll all end tonight while eating what I can only guess is water soup. It'll be over tonight? Yes. One way or another. It's time. 
it will come for me. To ensure he wins against Grendel, Beowulf asks Will to craft some new weapon, something that the camera keeps hidden from the audience so as not to spoil the fight. You don't want me to ruin the surprise. Beowulf runs into Kyra, who doesn't seem that excited to see him walk into combat. Beowulf. Don't do this. Don't do the single thing he came here to do and stop the monster that's killing everyone in the castle? Well, I guess he could always leave the castle. Oh, wait, you can't, because we have a mob of murderous psychopaths out there. What are you expecting to do, lady? Have more of that water soup? It was night. He'd been drinking, as usual. He wanted me. I refused. He started to beat me, so I stabbed him. Now he's come back to kill us. And that right there is the big build-up. Everyone thinks Grendel is actually Kyra's dead husband returned from the grave because ghosts are totally a thing, and why was this set in the future? Fortunately, Beowulf sees this red herring for what it is immediately. The beast is not your husband. What makes you so sure? Ghosts don't eat people. Now do you see why I spent so much time harping on this? The movie spent so much time and effort building this idea up, but doesn't use it as a dramatic twist. Instead, it offers the obvious conclusion it was working towards, then dissolves that idea in the very next breath. Oh my god, I haven't seen writing this pointless since the last 30 minutes of Repo Man. So Beowulf descends to the basement, which is flooded for some reason, to await his fight with Grendel. So did Beowulf know this place was down here, or did he flood the room himself? God help him if it's the latter and he didn't tell Hrothgar about this plan beforehand. Oh no, my Van Halen records! Grendel does show up, and not only does Beowulf power up with multiple backflips, he does it in slow motion. And you remember that point I made earlier about weapons not working on Grendel? Well... The movie got that part right, Beowulf does disarm Grendel, but he uses a punching dagger to do so. Okay, and now we finally get some real literary analysis into this because the movie screwed this up and hard. This was a dirty move and it counts as a double failure. One, because Beowulf used a weapon while Grendel was unarmed, and two, because he used a hidden blade. In the poem, Beowulf fought Grendel without any weapons because not only was Grendel impervious to all weapons thanks to a curse, but because it was dishonorable for a warrior to fight on uneven grounds. Winning unarmed would also earn Beowulf extra honor, which, as you can imagine, was a big deal for the classic hero types. What Lambert did was tantamount to cheating and was far less impressive than what the real Beowulf accomplished, which was tearing Grendel's arm off at the shoulder with his bare hands! The movie remembered that Grendel was supposed to lose an arm, but they accomplished it in a terrible way. The Russell Crowe version made their own questionable choices, but they understood the source material better than this! So, Nameless and his men are still guarding the perimeter until they see Grendel's arm being hung from the castle walls. Apparently, this serves as enough proof that the castle is safe, and they all decide to leave. We're finished here. Break it all down. We're moving out. Am I the only one who finds it weird that this murderous fanatical cult would take one look at this and decide that that's enough to warrant leaving their posts? I mean, they had no problem murdering a woman without even a farcical trial. The nutjobs in Salem were more stable than these guys. It's almost like they existed to force everyone stuck inside the castle to stay stuck in a meaningless battle of attrition. It's not like you could have a society in which one's monetary value was arbitrary through land ownership and so the king and all of his knights would have a reason to stay and fight for it. Oh, wait! So, with Grendel dead, Beowulf has no reason to stick around any longer. He packs his things to leave when Kyra comes to visit him with a confession. So now it's over, I suppose you'll be leaving us. I've finished here. Well, then you'll leave without knowing my biggest secret. There's more. One more? And that is... How I feel. Beowulf rejects her, explaining that he won't fit the badass lunar stereotype if she follows him around. 
But this isn't good enough for Kyra, who presses the issue, giving us this incredibly cringy line. How do you know it wasn't me that drew you to this place? Because you're not evil. Maybe not. But tonight I'm full of magic. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Who do you think felt worse there? Rona Mitchell for giving the line? Or the screenwriter who put it to paper? Rothgar gathers all the survivors into the main hall, including some women and children who I thought were all dead, and proposes a toast while Roland smokes a tree branch. To Beowulf. Roland, however, is feeling jealous, not just because Beowulf outperformed him, but because Kyra didn't reciprocate his confession. All I've ever wanted was you. No. I love you. I know. So, dealing with a wounded pride and a set of blue balls, Roland doesn't last long against the topless woman when she comes looking for him. Tell me, is this real enough for you? And as several of you have probably guessed by now, this woman is Grendel's mother. While Grendel's mom goes down on Roland, have fun with that image, Kyra and Beowulf reflect in their own afterglow, though Beowulf clearly wastes no time in getting dressed again. But during Pillow Talk, Kyra manages to wheedle Beowulf's tragic origin story out of him. Because of course it's tragic. And that's how we learn who Beowulf's father is. Who was he? My mother died never knowing. But the elders had no doubt. They told me my father was Baal, god of darkness, lord of lies. Um, bullshit. If there's one thing the original story does a lot, it's point out characters' lineage. Everyone is blah blah, son of what's his face. Constantly repeated as if the parents were being foreshadowed for a later appearance. Beowulf's father was a man named Ecthio. He wasn't some demon that the screenwriters pulled out of a Google search. The only thing that stops me from becoming evil is fighting evil. This was all just an attempt to make Beowulf a brooding loner, someone with a dark past living a life engorged in tragedy, which is wrong. The original poem is very simplistic as far as character building, so we get a clear picture that Beowulf is a badass upstanding hero. He was the benchmark for all men to aim for. Did he have a lot of depth? Well, not really. The whole poem is just one example after another of how awesome he is. He risked his well-being to do the right and honorable thing and had a pretty good life because of it, rising to become a king in later years. True, this story comes across as substandard fanfiction by today's standards, but it's a classic for a reason, having inspired countless other stories and heroes after him. Beowulf doesn't require some needlessly complicated backstory, he's fine the way he is. He needs adventure, not a warm shoulder to cry on about how he might actually be a spawn of evil. We need less Squall and more Zidane here. Final Fantasy IX was a better game anyway. But the tragic backstory is suddenly shoved aside when Beowulf detects another source of evil. You killed it! Not the beast. Something older, subtler. Kyra and Rothgar go to check on the main hall, only to discover that everyone is dead, including Roland. <gasps> my friend. And only my friend. A dark pall is cast over the room as Grendel's mom shows up, ready to end things. You whore! Harsh words for the mother of your child. The one you call the Beast? He's your son, Grendel. And something else the movie changed was who Grendel's father was, just for a quick, cheap tie-in. If you go by the poem, then you have no idea who Grendel's father is because he isn't listed. At best, we can tell that Grendel's a descendant of Cain and therefore evil. All this for love spurned? Love? You're so simple. Long before the outpost was built, this was my land and my home. My son has the older claim. He has come for what is his right. We see flashes back to when his wife killed herself after discovering that Hrothgar had impregnated Grendel's mom. This feels like it was supposed to be some attempt at creating hubris for Hrothgar, showing his pride before the fall. Except his backstory is more about the hazards of being lustful. Honestly, this serves as a better example of why you shouldn't stick your dick in crazy. Hrothgar goes to attack Grendel's mom, but by some stroke of luck, Grendel still isn't dead somehow. Did the son of a bitch learn how to cauterize his wound or something? Seriously, how is he not dead? Oh, and now it's okay for him to fight Rothgar even after refusing twice? 
And not only that, Grendel somehow crushes the man in a one-armed bear hug. And now Grendel reminds me of Lenny from Of Mice and Men. The reason Grendel couldn't fight Rothgar in the book was because Rothgar was protected by God. Instead, what we have here looks like the kid picking a side in a nasty custody battle. So Beowulf rushes into battle, of course doing a backflip, and rams Roland's sword into the bloody cavern that used to be Grendel's shoulder. That was a mistake. No, keeping him alive was a mistake. How was he not bled to death? So Grendel's mom banters a bit, uses the you and I are the same trope. And then it's time for her final form. And she's... Come, child. Sample the true delights of flesh with me. made in 1999 and the company didn't have the best special effects, but something like this wouldn't even pass for PS1 era graphics. Just look at how disjointed that is. Grendel's mom doesn't even match anything around her. There's such a dip in quality and lighting that this monster clearly doesn't belong in this background. And the layering isn't even right. You'd get the same effect by jiggling a picture of something on the end of a popsicle stick. It's time. So, with Grendel's mom in hot pursuit, Beowulf needs to supercharge his next attack, so he backflips twice onto a banister, somehow, and goes for the ultimate 90s backflip combo! Beowulf gets cornered, but manages to slice at the monster's neck when he realizes that she has gasoline for blood. That's... really weird. Seeing a chance though, Beowulf jumps off the banister, then goes for the gold by flipping off a table, giving the movie a grand total of 25 Beowulf flips for the movie! Well done, well done to the man who makes professional gymnasts look like tryhards. Getting cornered again, Beowulf slices open Grendel's mom's neck, and we finally see why this movie was set in the future. See, throughout the movie, we've seen these gas pipes all over the place for no apparent reason. So, the movie needed a quick way to finish her off, and this was an easy way to manage it. I'm sorry, but if fire could kill her, then why would she spend so much time in a place with so much fire that they have seven chimneys and multiple braziers burning at all hours of the day? It's like this castle literally has fuel to waste and they go out of their way just to use it up. And I guess we can just ignore that in the book, Beowulf grabbed a giant sword and sliced her in half a la berserk. Well, since Grendel's mom burst into flames, the castle follows suit, collapsing in an inferno while Beowulf and Kyra escape as the only survivors. I lost everyone I loved in that place. My whole life was there. Kyra doesn't mull in her depression for long, though, grinning at the idea of joining Beowulf in future adventures. Never mind that she just lost everything in her life, and her only worldly possessions are now this horse and the clothes she's wearing. The two of them ride off into the distance, pretending that this is a happy ending, even though dozens of people are dead and no one seems to care. If you name a single aspect of this movie, I can assure you that it sucks. The acting? It sucks. The music? It sucks. The props? Those really suck. Settings, story, script, lighting, and costumes all suck. I bet even the catering sucked. The movie is awful in every conceivable way. I want to call this movie so bad it's good, but it has too much polish for me to really say that. It gets everything so wrong that it still can't get that right. You might have some fun watching it drunk with friends, but it still pales in comparison to movies like Birdemic or Samurai Cop. There's no wonder how this got a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. It gets a 1 out of 5. I do so love old classic titles, and translations like Haney's makes reading them easier. 
It's not just the story itself that's fun, but I also find the history attached to it fascinating. The story and characters are really basic, but I like to think of them as a time capsule for how stories used to be told. Unfortunately, there are several scenes that do kind of come out of nowhere, don't really affect anything, then leave. Considering the oral tradition, I'm sure there was plenty of information lost, which makes me wonder what else there could have been to this story. Either way, it's a great classic for a reason. Beowulf gets a 4 out of 5. I know I spent a lot of time harping on the story being set in the future, but the movie did absolutely nothing with it. If you want to update the old tale to a new setting, do it. But at least try! This whole thing was so half-assed that outside of the few brief moments like this LED telescope, I couldn't be sure that this was supposed to be set after the apocalypse. I'm sure there's some story to be told about Beowulf in the future, but at least put some effort into it like making Beowulf a Spartan or something. Quick! Someone write that fanfic! In short, this movie and its crew don't understand Beowulf's character, his story, or even how to tell a story. This one is garbage through and through. As an adaptation, it gets a 1 out of 5. So you're telling me, the most advanced technological achievement I've ever seen in my god-given life was created by accident. You kind of get used to that. Apparently I'm gifted. You're a loony. So give me all your notes. Show me how you made this thing. Uh, notes? Yes, notes, sketches, details, plans. Show me what steps you took to get to this button. Uh, I just did everything in my head. You don't even have any godforsaken notes? What kind of a scientist are you? I'm not a scientist. I'm a chef. And a field medic. It's really the only thing you can do without blowing something up. Things don't always blow up. Alright, fine. This can still work. Can you at least guide me through the steps you did in your head to get to this pint? Probably. I guess I could try. Yeah, except we can't. We have a crisis on our hands that we need to solve first. And what might that be? My sword was stolen by some guy with a rapier. I need to get it back, and I need NPC's help in finding it. A sword? Can't you just go out and buy a new one? Not this one. This one's magical, and I'm not gonna let some second-rate thief keep it! Besides, I think I need the thief's sword to cure the poison in Crimson's system. He's been surviving off of health potions for weeks. More of this magic business? You do know you sound crazy, right? I'm sure it does! But wait until I get my sword back, I'll prove magic is real! Fine. And what does this magic sword do? I... don't know. And how do you propose we find your thief or your sword? He doesn't know that either. Thanks, buddy. You're a lot of help. That sounds entirely hopeless, and for the record, I think you're both idiots. Yeah, idiots with a what the fuck button. No, it stands for Whimsical Telemetric Function. My way is so much faster. Then give me my answers and you can go on with your hopeless quest. Kinda selfish the way you just walk in here and start demanding answers. Especially when we could have gotten those answers out of the same red-headed woman who stole this from us in the first place! By the way, did she teleport in when you first met her? Almost like it was magic, hmm? Call us idiots all you want, but at least we don't deny the obvious. Fine. You want me to waste my time helping you? I'm gonna need a guarantee that you'll give me the answers I need. Done. In writing. And I get what I want, regardless if we find your thief or your sword. Well, as long as you put in the effort. All right. Then it sounds like we're agreed. All right, so where do we start? It's a fundamental principle of science that all things put off a traceable signal. Metal detectors detect metal, obviously. 
Geiger counters for radiation, photo detectors, the list goes on. All right, and where does that lead us? It means, lad, that if your magic sword exists, and I'm not saying I believe you, but if it exists, it should be putting off some traceable signal. Okay then, let's just grab whatever machine you have and hook it up. It's not that simple. First, I need to know what I'm studying. A sample to examine. A control group, as it were. Okay, so what does that mean? Means you'll need to do some digging. You need to find another magic sword. <laughs>